Good morning, everyone. Um, I came to Taiwan for the first time in 1999, and uh, um, Felix mentioned this uh, 1999 inaugural conference. Well, I have pictures. <laughs> High school students, do you recognize the gentleman in the center? President Lee and this Victor Zhu, a famous son of Taiwan, to his left, Mike Dertuzos, founder of the uh, LCS, which turned into CCL, uh, to the right of President Lee, and, and that young guy over there is me. Um, <laughs> Uh, recognize this gentleman over there, you, you sort of occluded by the camera, Paul Shu, founder of uh, Epic. And uh, these are uh, baseball uh, hats, uh, Taipei Tigers. And you can see Josephine there. But here's a better picture of Josephine. She looks the same, <laughs> right? She looks the same. Anyway, well, you didn't come here to see these pictures, right? You came here because you want to hear about AI. Um, so, let's get started. I, I mean, the hype is unimaginable, um, but there's, it's, it's substantive too. There's clearly enormous benefits to artificial intelligence, whether it's in healthcare, whether it's in security, to protect against attacks that are probably being carried out by other AIs, or uh, financial services, um, uh, improving uh, the economy of uh, countries and so on. But there are a huge number of risks. Um, these are just a few of them. Unfair algorithms, catastrophic forgetting when you train an AI and it gets worse at something. It gets better at what you trained it for when you fine tune, but it gets worse at other things. Hallucinations, you know, a few percent of the time it just does crazy things. Um, data poisoning, Memorization, I'll talk a little bit about this as we go on. And uh, when we talk about data privacy, which is really the focus of my talk, um, there's the aspect of individuals and individuals' rights being violated, their privacy rights, and also not being compliant with the regulations, you know, be it the medical, the medical sector or the financial sector. So my talk, my research is focused on one of the issues of AI. But it's a huge issue, and it's the issue of protecting individual rights when uh, people use your data to go do things that you know, maybe they aren't supposed to, or maybe you gave them permission, but um, the fact they overreach, right? So um, I want to talk a little bit about uh, different kinds of privacy exposures. Now, generally speaking, training data has privacy concerns um, if they're your company's employees or maybe your company's customers, you run a machine learning training algorithm on it, you get a model, and uh, you have to protect this data through this process. But the fact is that if you actually deploy this model and you give it away, this exposure can hurt privacy of the individuals who gave you their training data, their pictures, you know, or maybe their salary information, their DNA. Their, their DNA. And not only that, what is a little bit scary is Let's assume that you take this ML model and you keep it hidden behind a firewall, but you want um, your customers or your um, collaborators to access this model in the sense that it should be useful for them. So they're allowed to give qu qu queries to the model and get responses back. Well, the fact is that the, the queries and the responses, the responses in particular, can expose individual privacy, individual data, personally identifiable information. And I'm just not just making this up. Um, when you um, query ChatGPT, don't give it to your personal information because it's going to take it and God knows what it's going to do with it. But coming back to what I was saying, um, you have stable diffusion vision models where you can give it a prompt and it can generate um, new images. Presumably these images are generated by AI, that they are of fictitious people. The, the claim is that there's no privacy concern. Here's an example, a paper written recently, where the training data had this lady's face, and her name is Anne Graham Lotz. Now, after the model was deployed, if you gave it the prompt, Anne Graham Lotz, this is the picture that is generated. Right? So it just memorized this lady's picture and just regurgitated it. Same thing with ChatGPT. Um, you give it the same word, you query it with the same word over and over, and it 
the specific word, um, it regurgitates personally identifiable information from the training data, right? So what's going on here is um, there's two things going wrong. First, this, the machine learning training isn't really learning a model, it's memorizing. And second, it's also exposing what it memorized, which is obviously exposing uh, people's personal information. So there's a whole lot of data out there that we can exploit to, um, to make things better for ourselves, to make um, things more efficient, you know, whether it's autonomous vehicles or financial services. So the big question is, how can we enable desirable uses of the data for all of these applications like health diagnostics, financial services, et cetera, while protecting individual privacy? And so that's really what I want to tell you about in the next 10 minutes or so. So the kinds of things that we'd like to do in research, and these are research prototypes, we'd like to build them, but they're not ready for deployment. I know there's a lot of people out here who uh, deploy software. And personally, you know, I don't write software that's good enough to deploy. Uh, but uh, what we'd like to do is build prototypes that uh, um, other people can take and uh, use as, um, um, as a way of uh, actually producing uh, uh, deployable software. So database analytics, um, which protects the privacy of individuals. For example, the United States had the 2020 census and they wanted to allow data analysts to uh, query the data that was collected by the census, but they can't publish the, the census data, that's illegal. Um, and so how do you um, protect an individual's address or uh, other information, ethnicity, demographics, while allowing data analysts to make queries of this data? Um, how do you allow the use of a deep learning model uh, while guaranteeing the pa individual patient privacy. So you want to do cancer detection using lung scans, but you can't publish lung scans of patients. In fact, in the United States, you, the hospitals can't even uh, give that lung scan away to another hospital unless the patient allows it. Um, and obviously everyone's talking about LLMs these days, and I give you some examples of training data leaking from LLMs, and we'd like to stop that. Right, so. Um, I'm going to get a little technical here, um, and uh, there's not a whole lot of math or anything, but there's some equations. And so you can treat this problem as an incredibly generic problem where you have X, and X is this unknown thing that the adversary doesn't know. It's, your, it's the sensitive data. It could be a huge amount of text. It could be a lot of images. And you do some processing on it, and uh, you, uh, that, the result of that is M of X. So M is a program that you run on it. Now, M could be something as simple as take the average of all of these salaries. So it's just one line of code. Or it could be an LLM training, which produces a model that has you know, billions of parameters. Right? And what we'd like to be able to do is, given any M, um, given any particular training algorithm, without having to know the details of it, we'd like to say that you can publish you know, M of X or something actually kind of uh, slightly different from M of X, as you'll see, while guaranteeing privacy for each of the elements of X. Right? So that's kind of the, the mathematical statement of the problem. Um, I want to say a little bit more about what it means to be private in the world of privacy and security. So in English, we want to say, here's this adversary, um, the bad person, and they shouldn't be able to recover our secret, you know, given this leakage. So what does this all mean? Well, we want to say that it doesn't matter what the adversary does. Now, the adversary has a certain amount of power, but the techniques that they use are unclear because, you know, they're smart and they're going to come up with things that we haven't thought about. But it shouldn't matter what they come up with. For arbitrary strategies, we want some sort of provable privacy guarantee. Cannot recover means that we bound the the, the success probability of the adversary to 10% or 1% or what have you. I mean, you're never going to make it 0%. Unfortunately, that's you know, usually too hard to do. But you can make it low enough that you can have some comfort in lowered risk. And then um, the recovery um, is essentially about, um, are you going to be able to um, estimate uh, the salary that you're trying to discover or, or perhaps the image of the person um, the blood type, or what have you. And it's not an exact estimate necessarily that you're worried about. An approximate estimate might be, be, might be bad enough. 
knowing 80% of the characters in your password is enough to break any system because you can brute force the other 20%. And finally, I said this already, but the leakage is what you put out in the world, the MFX. And you don't have to look inside of MFX, but if you know what MFX is, you should be able to do this analysis. So, so we have a notion called probably approximately correct privacy or pack privacy for short that I won't tell you very much about, but I want to give you some sense of what it does through um, essentially the operational example. And the idea is that um, you have X, it comes from some distribution. I'll say a little bit more about that. And there's some target inference problem called rho, which essentially says something like, well, I want to know if my image was used in this machine learning model. And I want, um, and, and if that is the case, then that's bad. But um, if I can set it up in terms of um, the machine learning model, not exposing whether a particular person's image, maybe mine, maybe yours, was used, then there's um, ambiguity associated with this output, and I have privacy. Because you can't tell if my salary was used or if my uh, uh, personal identifiable information was used. Um, that's a privacy metric. Um, or, as I mentioned with the password, don't get an approximation of whatever data was used within 5%, 10%. So before anything happens, you know, there's some guesswork that the adversary could do. And delta zero is the success rate that the adversary would have. And when you expose M of X, you end up, end up increasing that to delta. And this thing that we call the posterior advantage, you'd ideally like it to be zero because that says that the amount of exposure is, is that what was exposed doesn't hurt you. And you'd like to drive this posterior advantage down to as small as possible. Now, it may be the case that if M of X is memorizing, then it's going to leak a lot about X. So what are your options? Well, you can perturb M of X. You can change M of X a little bit. Rather than saying that the average salary of everyone in this room you know, corresponds to, you know, we'll call it you know, uh, $100,000, you say it's 95000 or 105000 and adding a little bit of noise can drive this posterior advantage down. Right? So that's kind of the math behind pack privacy. How do you um, take your model and expose it with perhaps minimal per perturbation so you can get a privacy proof? Right? Um, and in terms of the distribution, I'll say it really quickly. Um, assume that all of the data conservatively is public. Right? I mean, obviously it's not, but in this situation, humor me for a second, let's assume that it's public. And what we're going to do is take a random one half of it and do our analysis of it. And um, that random choice is hidden to the adversary. And um, if you expose this model that was generated by this random half, and the adversary can't tell if a particular element was in or not in terms of the X subset, then that's our privacy guarantee because the exposure didn't uh, expose the membership of a particular individual. Now, in reality, the adversary doesn't know all of this data, obviously. And the point is that you've done a conservative proof, and this proof is valid for a more realistic, less, less powerful adversary. So let me show you an example that puts it all together and close with uh, telling you about where we're at and what we have planned in the future. So. Um, some of you may know k-means, it's a clustering algorithm. In this case, let's say k is two. So you have a bunch of data points. They're, uh, they're all in blue. These are these individual points that have sensitivity, right? So this is a contrived example, but hopefully evocative. Um, you want to cluster these things, and you run an algorithm on it. And what you find is you don't care about privacy. You get these purple centroids that are essentially going to define these two clusters. And you expose these purple centroids, and your question is, the exposure of these purple centroids gives away something about these blue points, but what? And can you ensure, um, make some guarantee about a privacy of these blue points? Um, so you can take these purple centroids and you can use them to cluster any new point, uh, depending on whether it's closer to the one at the bottom or the one at the top. Right? So it's uh, basically unsupervised learning. Um, that's essentially our problem. The way pack privacy would work is, the way I've described it, is select half the points randomly. So you get these points out here. 
compute the same k-means algorithm on it, you get these red points out here corresponding to the centroids. Do this again. You get a, two different red points, a different red pair. Right? So if you look at what's happened here, um, let's assume you did this a few times, but in this case twice, you see that the red points in this case are kind of close to each other, and they're close to the purple points. And essentially what our theory tells you is that you can expose any pair of these red points, either one, jiggling them just a little bit, which is obviously not going to change things very much if it jiggles them just a little bit, and that is going to give you a guarantee on the non-exposure of, of any of the blue points that you saw. All right? So, as I said, a simple example, but this turns into this, what I think is a fairly powerful privatization template, which essentially says, whatever algorithm you have, run it on subsets of your data, get these various m of x ones, m of x twos, m of x threes, compute the stability of the outputs, just like the stability of these red centroids, uh, how much variation there is. Use that to figure out how much noise you need to add and only release the output with this noise added. And when you do that, you have a privacy proof at the end of it. So if you did that for this LLM, you did that for this vision, you would not get you know, that lady's face or the regurgita regurgitation of all of that text because this, this noise uh, would preclude that from happening um, in both instances. So in general, if you have stable algorithms, like the example I showed you, um, the amount of noise you have to add is pretty small. But in some cases, I mean, if the algorithm isn't great because it overfits and it memorizes, unfortunately, to privatize it, you'll have to do a bunch of work and uh, perhaps change the output quite dramatically. Right? So that's all I had with respect to the actual techniques. I want to tell you a little bit about what we did and what we're going to do next. Um, we've privatized a lot of algorithms. They're very, it's fairly simple ones. Um, people learn these in um, computer science undergraduate school, uh, and uh, they're fairly famous. I won't get into the details, but for all these algorithms, they're fairly stable, and uh, you can do pretty well for the classic algorithms in terms of privatizing them. So you could use these algorithms with impunity, assuming you follow this framework. Um, we'd like to do the private database analytics, as I mentioned. So we're building a database uh, where uh, you can access the database, the queries of the database, uh, uh, produce responses that don't leak individual information, and uh, working on this with a former student who's a professor at Wisconsin-Madison, who's a database expert, Chiang Yao Yu. Um, we'd love to be able to do things like um, guarantee the privacy of individual patients when you're doing things like cancer diagnostics. Um, Lung scans of patients used to create a model, uh, but those individual lung scans have to be protected, even though that model is being used for new patients, perhaps in the same hospital or outside. Right? It turns out you have to do a little bit more than what I've described, but uh, if I had an hour, I'd tell you all about it, but I don't. Um, and finally, um, you know, I think LLMs are probably incorrect on this slide. We'll call them medium language models, because you know, I, I can't afford training an LLM. You know, it's, uh, it's a billion dollars, right? So uh, um, what we'd love to be able to do is be able to create essentially something like a GPT-2 that has the same, very same guarantee that I described to you with respect to protecting the individual data. And we think that's uh, a goal that is possible. Um, so let me close. Um, I see this lady here with two minutes walking down here. So that's, that's great because this is my last slide, right? I'm punctual, even though I showed you pictures, right? That shouldn't have counted. The picture shouldn't have counted on my time. Um, but anyway, um, so yeah, so I told you about pack privacy. I'm pretty excited about it. Um, one of the nice things about it is that you can actually privatize an algorithm without analyzing the details of it, without the source code being given to you. You just have to run the algorithm on the data uh, that you have, subsets of data, and that'll, uh, that, that'll give you the information you need to privatize. So tell us your favorite algorithm, and we'll automatically privatize it. And if it uh, you know, doesn't privatize well, it's your fault. Okay. Um, but, but I'll leave you with, I think, the most exciting thought. Uh, which is, um, when you think about overfitting and memorization, it 
is actually doing things that are obviously pretty unstable, but that's not machine learning. That is copying the input to the output, right? It's not gener generative AI, it's not generalized AI. So in fact, the machine learning world is looking at improving generalizability. You want stability that a particular data element doesn't change your output that dramatically. If one image you know, or a new lung scan changed your machine learning model that's going to, pro that's going to predict you know, cancer dramatically, you, know, you had a thousand patients, you added one patient, and this model changed dramatically, I mean, that's the problem, right? So I'm telling my machine learning colleagues, hey, you know, get better at producing these stable machine learning models, and after that, you'll automatically have privacy. All right, thank you.